uh, yeah, the title slide here that we have is is the slightly longer version of what uh, I think we summarized a little bit more effectively there in that basically what we're trying to do is uh, see what signals may be there to identify the higher end QLCS tornado and straight line wind events um, using some precursor signals. It borrows, it, it basically takes a lot of what we're already doing uh, and we just try to use it and apply it a slightly different way. And, it, and uh, it's preliminary in terms of this study, It's it, meaning that it's still very much going on. Um, we've added, since I, uh, since I calculated the numbers I'm gonna present here, um, we've added about another 100 cases, but we haven't run the data on them yet and gotten all the environmental information. So we're just, it's one of those things where we're, we're doing it uh, on top of what we already, you know, have been assigned to do and whatnot. So we're just, as we have an extra moment, we're adding cases, uh, but we'll go into what we're doing here. Uh, we're looking again to identify precursor signals for QLCS tornado and high-end wind events, and particularly looking for precursor signals for stronger events, basically 80, 85 mile per hour plus, both from straight line wind and tornado. And the idea being that if you're making warning decisions, you know, if, if I give you the choice between catching the 90 mile per hour event and the 60 mile per hour event, we're going to I will all mostly go to that 90 mile per hour event and seeing what precursor signals may be there that would really clue you in that this is a particularly serious event, whether it be in the form of a tornado or in the form of straight line wind. Uh, we all, you know, we, we, you know how easy it is to not be able to see an EF zero at 65 or, you know, 80 miles or 75 miles per hour. Um, it, but it's also equivalently uh, easy in a lot of cases to not see the higher end QLCS tornadoes with much lead time other than there's a tornado debris signature or there's a strong uh, couplet. Uh, so we want to uh, uh, go a little further than the current system, which kind of identifies yes, no tornado warning. This being a, a little more a yes, no versus is this going to be something that we're really going to be concerned about that really has the potential to cause damage to life and property. So the way that we did this, we started with the three ingredients method uh, and we uh, also uh, and we examined other environmental and storm characteristics. So I tried to take the, the three ingredients method and then add, you know, a handful of other ingredients that might work uh, while we were collecting the data. Things like the mesovortex strength, the depth, uh, the speed that the storm is or the rotational speed. Uh, rotational velocity and combinations of ingredients. We collected each piece of data individually so we could recombine them in multiple different ways and see what we came up with. Uh, the methodology was to go through, right now we'll, we've split it up by the folks that are working it from like January 1st, 2019 to August 1st, 2019. And I've just gone through the SPC Severe Thunderstorm Event Archive. And when we see an event that looks like it's got, you know, a decent amount of wind, like if it's T2, W-O, H-O, I'm not too concerned about adding that to the database, but this moderate with 157, 609, maybe 43, 190, we certainly want to look and see if that was a QLCS event. So then we'll look at the, you know, it makes it very easy on that page to look at this, which looks like that could probably have been created by some, form. at least a portion of it would have been linear forcing. Sometimes it's pretty obvious when it supercells and you've just got hail and tornadoes tracking across uh, one little area. And then we can go to the meso analysis archive and the radar archive and see, yes, there's definitely a line there. Uh, and then our final kind of quality check is deep layer effective shear of 25 knots or greater. And that uh, is designed to catch things that are truly organized wind events and not just sporadic straight line, you know, just sporadic uh, buoyancy driven downbursts that may happen to be occurring in a line that it's an organized MCS kind of by the definition that we would expect. And it would be something that you would at least consider uh, a tornado warning for uh, if the right signatures were in place rather than a summertime pulse severe thunderstorm event where you, you may see a land spout or you may see a brief tornado, but it's not the primary concern that you have. You're looking mainly for downbursts and those individual uh, bursts. So again, yeah, we'd look for deep shear. In this case, we have a linear system and we have deep layer shear of 100 knots and an obvious line kind of looks like it takes up about 800 miles 
uh, across. So we've definitely got one, a case that we would want to look into. And then we'll capture the individual radar data. So like for this event, I would start with the Lake Charles radar and then grab the Shreveport radar maybe, and then uh, Jackson, Memphis, uh, Greenwood, Mississippi and whatnot. And we would go up through and capture the individual ADAD data and look at the last full volume scan before a documented tornado or wind damage event. And then we'd also grab a vol one volume scan before that as well. Uh, and so we would also separate our samples by 45 miles to 60 miles or 45 to 60 minutes. So in this case, we had a tornado that occurred south of Dothan that we would have added to the database as one event. Even if it lifted for a second, we would just go to the start of the event here instead of oversampling one um, event. But then you say, well, what about going if there's a new there, there was an event that occurred here just right after um, the uh, uh, the tornado or right after this volume scan that was separated by about 40 miles in about 60 minutes we might look at uh, at that area and, and consider that a new case because there's not been any damage that had been reported or occurred and we have the advantage of looking at this in most cases several months after the event so the damage surveys are complete and there's not any question about well did a lot of damage occur there that we don't know about yet like you would have operationally so we'd say okay there was a break there and then sort of a new phenomena occurred and we would also perhaps look at this portion of the line which is in a different uh shear orientation and you know just a totally different uh, uh kinematic setup than what we have going along the uh the uh alabama and georgia border there uh, uh east of dothan kind of southeast of columbia uh, and so you would look at that and say, okay, well, these are two data points here, one to the north and one to the south, that will collect uh, our nudgers and our environmental data uh, and, and start that case. So we would collect uh, this element first, uh, which is the storm motion direction and basically the line orientation um, is our storm motion in our linear event. So if the line is oriented, the reflectivity is oriented kind of to the 270, and it's moving at 40 knots, we put in 270 at 40 so we can calculate our line normal shear. We'd mark whether or not a tornado occurred and if it did, what its EF rating was. And then also the peak wind speed, which is sort of the main discriminator in this case. Uh, in this event here, we had an EF3 with 150 miles per hour. And I believe that's the strongest event that we've collected in our database. Um, and, and then we would look at the three ingredients method. Was it balanced in a balanced and shear dominant portion of the line? Was it zero to three line normal shear? And the way that we calculate that is uh, the SPC 40 kilometer um, mesoanalysis archive. Andy Dean has a script that we run that gives us yes and no on that. And then is there a rear inflow jet that's present? Uh, and then we look at the nudgers, do, you know, the descending rear inflow jet, the line break, front reflectivity notch, mesovortex. And, and with this, you just abbreviations that we have for what we've what what is already on the sheet uh, that the the trip team presented, uh, and then we'll also make notes. And this is seeming to be the uh, one of the more interesting elements of this uh, study at this point. Is it semi discrete? Is it an MCV? Is the damage occurring at the very front of the line? Is it more towards the mid portion where it does look doesn't look like there was a leading edge wind event? Was it sort of embedded within the line, or was it as we see a lot with MCVs, sort of at the back side of the line? Uh, and then we will measure the uh, mesovortex strength uh, if a mesovortex is present, and we we have a pretty liberal. Uh, threshold there. It's about 15 knots rotational velocity just because we might as well collect the data while we're here uh, and those weaker mesovortex vortices will uh, will show up when we calculate uh, the, the rotational velocity and the rotational speed. Uh, but we'll capture the V-rot and diameter, the bottom and the top of the mesovortex and then this is where we begin to get the automated uh, gathering of our uh, mesoanalysis parameters. So it's a national domain, so we're looking literally everywhere we can. If, a, if QLCS occurs in Washington State or Washington, D.C., we're looking at it as potentially to add. And at this case, and I need meant to update that, we have about 328 cases so far. In the data that I'm going to present here, though, this is only the initial 228 that we've done the initial, hmm, this is interesting, analysis for. So the preliminary findings show that the nudgers appear to be skillfully identifying problematic processes in a as a precursor, so sort of an independent validation of, uh, of sort of the 
processes and what we're trying to do with the three ingredients method that, uh, that it does seem to be working, especially the nudgers. And a combination of environmental and radar characteristics do appear to discriminate between tornado and non-tornado events with some skill, and we'll present that here, and between all events that are plus or minus. So you're looking at some events that are tornado or no tornado, and then you're looking at events that are 80 mile per hour and higher or below, and both of them you can set thresholds that will give you skillful, based on the, based on the limited cases we've run so far. That's, we want to collect about 1,000 or 1,200 at least, and then we feel like we can say pretty consistently, okay, yeah, we think this works. Out of 225, 300, you, we're, we've got enough to, to do what we're doing here, which is, hey, check this out. But we don't obviously want to publish that or really push it until we get the data and the science uh, where we're a little more confident and that there's not any oversampling issues. And I've been looking into that too about different statistical methods we can do to, uh, to try to be as precise and uh, useful as we can with the information. And it may be an improvement to an existing three ingredients methods by using its pieces slightly differently at the end of the day. It may be pretty close. Um, but here's what we look at with the nudgers and the radar and environment. So three uh, different elements that we combine together, zero to one kilometer storm relative velocity multiplied by nudgers. And that's just, just straight, simple, SRH that say 300 times four nudgers are present would be 1200 and it would be you know here on the line actually about right here. There is some box and whisker separation. There's some overlap too, which is pretty apparent, but there's a little bit of a separation in the means that make me kind of intrigued. Rotational velocity multiplied by the nudgers has a little better separation. Again, still some overlap, but enough to make you kind of go okay. And then rotational speed of the circulation, which is just uh, V-rot divided by uh, the diameter of the meso, uh, shows maybe a little better uh, difference in tornadic events uh, with the blue being tornadic and the orange being non-tornadic. And then there's lots of different permutations that we can experiment with since we put the pieces together individually. Our rotational speed multiplied by zero to one SRH. And then when we did ro rotational velocity times the zero to one line normal shear, and I divided it by 10 just to keep the numbers uh, a little bit simpler and then multiply that by nudgers and there's some there's some separation there so we just just experimenting and playing around with the numbers and seeing what might happen to be the most successful uh, combination uh, and then also what was interesting is that two volume scans before tornado the 10 uh, 10 minute prior rotational speed and the zero to three kilometer and zero to one kilometer line normal shear showed some separation in, in QLCS tornadoes, which is interesting because the paper that uh, Randy Bowers and myself put out last summer said, you know, rotational speed in QLCSs and, and rotational velocity doesn't seem to give us a whole lot. And we were just looking at it in a vacuum, but when we combined it with the line normal shear, as you might have expected, both in the zero to three and the zero to one, then we started to see some things that looked pretty interesting and started to separate. Again, still some overlap, uh, but enough to kind of go, maybe there's a little something there. And it all passes uh, the uh, task square testing for uh, independence. So it makes you go, okay, there's a little something. here. So when we just do the raw statistics, if we do the three ingredients method plus three nudgers and then three ingredients method plus five nudgers, trying to issue tornado warnings, you get these statistics. Now, a forecaster should be able to execute this better. One of the weaknesses, there was a couple of weaknesses I noticed in just applying the raw three ingredients method where MCVs, in sort of that hybrid MCV where you've got, it's got linear features, but it's also kind of got this MCV feature. You would, you would see that be more shear dominant and it wouldn't pass the three ingredients method test right off the bat, where a forecaster should be able to recognize that this is still a tornado threat and whatnot. So it, it, it is, I think the three ingredients method works better than this in, uh, in its application. But if we took the zero to one kilometer storm relative velocity and multiplied it just by the nudgers and then made the threshold 1200, POD, our POD is about 755, CSI is 510, and the high key skill score is 384, so it's better at that T5 minutes just doing it raw when you just look at the numbers from an objective standpoint, uh, zero to three kilometers storm relative velocity. And I did this for all of them, and they all have a varying degree of skill. Uh, these were some of the more skillful ones when we combined everything together. So it, set, it showed some promise that there, there may be a window to improve on, on what we're doing. Um, 
if we take the pieces of the system that we're already using and then perhaps we recombine them in a slightly different way and it's possible that as we increase our cases that the the separation will decrease and if that's so that'll make us i think it'll make us all feel better about okay let's just keep doing what we're doing uh but i'm curious to see if there's a way to do it uh a little bit better and then the lead time values uh at five minutes and then two volume scans prior also the uh skill held up rotational speed multiplied by zero to one srh showed if you issued a tornado warning at that point you would be as CSI of 0 0.503, which is not too bad. It's not great, but it's not not bad. Better, good enough to be like, yeah, let's let's look at this. Uh, and then the, would the nudgers work at that time frame at 10 minutes out? Probably. And I didn't know that that was a possibility until after we had collected the cases that we've collected. So probably we'll go back and look at the nudgers at T minus 10 minutes and see if that works. Uh, that was one of the things where we did our initial preliminary data analysis and said, oh, well, I wish we'd gathered that while we were in the process of gathering everything else. But uh, those nudgers, I suspect, will probably also work because it's, it's the same idea that acceleration of the line, the updraft, downdraft convergence region. So it's intriguing and, uh, and probably will work. But this is what I think is uh, probably most interesting. If we, if we strip the tornado classification off of it and just go straight line wind event, or tornado wind event, it doesn't matter if it's spinning or not. We just say 80 mile per hour, which is where you really start to get into that more life-threatening uh, wind. There's separation with the rotational speed of the zero to one SRH and the zero to one SRH and nudgers, um, and several other parameters provide that same basic separation. So it's intriguing that, uh, that there's still separation and we did I did look at it based on do the tornado events dominate like is are the 90 mile per hour tornadoes most of the event and it isn't really there's about an equal about an equal I think probably like out of all the cases there's like six more tornadoes that are 90 mile per hour and above but there are several uh surveyed 90 100 and 110 mile an hour straight line wind cases in our database that we've collected so far too so we're not over sampling tornado and getting a, a, a false signal here I don't believe now the more we more cases we gather we'll, we'll, we'll prove whether or not that that's the case but um, it does seem to be that even with a straight line wind event that some of the nudgers and some of the precursor signals like the line normal shear the rotational speed uh, and the uh, zero to one zero to three kilometer storm relative velocity all can be something that you can use and, and it's kind of what we've been doing all along but I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to get sort of a threshold to use as a general guideline the stats for discrimination at 80 miles per hour uh, and again several things were skillful in past chi-square testing so far uh, rotational velocity and nudgers at this point zero to one line normal and nudgers and rotational speed multiplied by nudgers and given a certain threshold uh, lined out the best. You can see those skill scores are a little lower than, um, than what they were with Tornado, but they're close enough uh, that it doesn't look like a huge difference at the end of the day. So it's still intriguing that we may have something that, that will be useful here. And then again, I know two other signals. One, we were at, at two volume scans beforehand and at zero to one SRH multiplied. And you can see there is a little bit of a drop, but it's not a huge drop. Uh, enough to just say, okay, well, there's nothing there. In some of the previous studies we've done, the difference between the fourth and the fifth volume scan, CSI is like 0 0.401 and then 100 or some huge cliff that it falls off of in, in supercell tornadoes. Uh, and there's a few cases maybe where at five, vo five volume scans in advance, you can get some get some advance notice and a little stronger speed, but but not most of them. In this case, it held up pretty consistently to that two volume scan. And we haven't tried to look earlier than that uh, because honestly, I didn't expect that there would be much of a signal even at two volume scans. So uh, that was, I guess, sort of a, a positive surprise and positive result and maybe grounds for going back and gathering that data up as well. So 90 mile per hour tornado discriminator tried to do that too, which is if I'm going to issue a tornado warning, I want to issue a tornado warning on 90 mile per hour tornadoes are stronger I, or better, better phrasing that I want to make absolutely certain I don't miss a relatively strong QLCS tornado. And the initial 
indication there is that there is a little bit something there, but we don't have a ton of those cases. If you think we've only got what, coming up on 250 cases and only about half of those are tornadoes and then only about another half of those are are strong tornadoes. So we just don't have enough cases to feel like there's anything worth really writing home about there yet. But it is what we have seen does kind of make you go, oh, maybe we'll be able to do that and discriminate between. And I didn't want to do EF2 tornadoes like we do with supercells where strong tornado or, or not, because the number of EF2 plus QLCS tornadoes is going to be relatively small compared to the number of sub EF2 QLCS tornadoes. So I looked at 90 mile per hour, which is you know where most of our homes are rated and where you start to get the more significant roof damage. So if we're going to find a threshold, I wanted to lower it a little bit from our supercell significant tornado threshold uh, to see where those processes that were stronger were going on. The overall takeaways from what we've got, that there's broadly similar skills shown at multiple per permutations. And as we collect more cases, I think it's uh, I think it's possible that we will see sort of a few horses lead the way, but uh, we still don't know for sure yet. Zero to one kilometer line normal shear, rotation of velocity multiplied by nudgers, rotation of velocity by itself and not doing the RSC where you divide it by the uh, diameter. Uh, multiplied by environmental parameters showed some skill, whereas as I mentioned before, RSC by itself in a prior uh, study showed I believe it was a Heidke skill score of 0 0.02 <laughs> which uh, was a little bit less than what uh, you would want uh, to be using as a warning decision making uh, by quite some you know <laughs> a few orders of magnitude there so there's, and then zero to one kilometer shear versus zero to one line normal shear which one does better they may be they're similar in terms of what they're trying to measure and it may not matter too much I'm seeing you know, interesting things in MCVs, the more we look at those, and very likely we will separate the taxonomy a little bit more between sort of what I've called super QLCS systems, like what we had in South Carolina on uh, Easter Monday, uh, where we had the EF4 tornado in a storm. There were two big tornadoes in, in the Columbia, or the Charleston CWA that morning. One was an EF3 that, uh, that had a more classic QLCS look at the beginning and produced sort of a backside uh, where at the rear, at the at the, inf at the interface of the rear inflow jet, as you'd expect it, it, it was a, it's sort of an atypical QLCS process as opposed to the leading edge of a bow echo. It produced an EF3 where about an hour and a half later, a storm developed that produced the EF4 and it was a much clearer, more clearly a supercell process with an independent deep mesocyclone that was 26 or 28,000 feet uh, and had a, the hook echo and all the things you'd look for in a supercell, but it didn't start that way. It, up, it well, downscaled, I guess is the best way to put it. We talk about processes upscaling where we have individual cells that become a line. This process sort of downscaled into a supercell and looking at the taxonomy of that and seeing, because I think those are going to be pretty big, strong tornado producers when those processes are occurring in a certain way. Uh, and I want to try to document that out and flesh that out, uh, but we just don't have enough cases yet to do that. We've tested, also tested for signal domination by one element, uh, and it doesn't really work. It isn't that the zero to one kilometer SRH was really high in all of our big cases, and that's why it's there. It was pretty uniformly where we have SRH of 400 and 500, and we have cases that didn't produce, but they also didn't have the radar characteristics. So I've been trying to make sure that we don't have have the signal domination where we're just missing the fact that it's one thing that's that's over being oversampled there. And there's probably a more elegant mathematical solution that we haven't explored, but I really do prefer to keep it simple. Since we're trying to make warning decisions in real time, it would be awesome in my eyes to be able to say, okay, we've got environmental SRH around 300. Our, and then so our, our nudgers multiplied by SRH threshold is gonna be 1200. So if our SRH is 300, we just need four nudgers and we need to start thinking about tornado warnings. That would be pretty easy to go into the event with um, because you don't get those nudgers combined typically unless you have relatively favorable environment for tornado potential. There's sort of a, it's kind of like a hook echo. You know, you can get a hook echo without a tornado, but you don't typically get a hook echo unless the environment's favorable for supercells. Um, a, a true hook echo, you get something that looks like it, but you don't get a supercell unless you have 
a favorable environment for supercells. So in order to get those signals, you have to have some favorability uh, to the environment. So there may be a way to do that and to keep it relatively simple. But the nudgers in general seem to be consistently the most promising, which I don't think is too surprising to anybody. It's showing that ex local acceleration of the updraft downdraft convergence or in the updraft downdraft interface, um, updraft downdraft convergence zone. Uh, and it does seem to be working. And I haven't been able to see anything, you know, looking repetitively at cases. Oh, there's a little something here. Or there's a little something else that we haven't accounted for. I just haven't seen anything consistently occurring that that needs to really be added to that um, that I've been able to gather looking at the three or four hundred cases so or three hundred cases so far. Um, but I think maybe we've got the correct things identified. Um, and especially certainly to continue with what we're doing right now, uh, but also maybe uh, going in the future and trying to extend it out uh, a little bit further. And again, the aim is to increase cases to at least a thousand. I've got a team of folks uh, working on it. It's slow going, especially with the pandemic. Uh, all of our work duties have kind of been thrown up in the air and the consistent used to uh, pre pandemic. I was in a pretty good rhythm of working on it for an hour every other day or something like that. And right now, Everything has just been crazy. So um, I just haven't found that rhythm to get the cases going. It moves very quickly once you get it going, but it's all done by hand. So it just takes a little bit longer uh, than it would. And that concludes what I had here. I don't know if anybody has any questions or thoughts.